I'd be real happy on this morning. Yeah, being excited is, 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 is good for, for having the energy to put on a good presentation, right? Good morning. Good morning. Hi there. Hey. How are you, Ashley? Well, nice to see your name, Gigi. Oh, and there's your. <laughs> I'm today. Yay. <laughs> okay, you guys are working over there. Uh, James Barry is, is James. Uh, Hello, Ashley, I put in the chat. Uh, how do you pronounce your last name? It's like Dun Pasta, but with a P. Danasta. Danasta. Danasta, yeah. All right. Maybe it's I'll just do first names. <laughs> you can pronounce it however you want. It's fine. <laughs> Um, quick intro. I'm uh, one of the DSW volunteers. I'm here to make sure all of the technical things work with you guys. Um, who is going to need to be made co-host here? Who's kind of like the main speaker? Jen? Okay. Yes. Um, and can co- well, I'll find out. I can make uh, multiple co-hosts. Okay. As long as I have control over the breakout rooms, I'm great. Yes. I do. Yeah. Yes, you have um, and so quick little rundown. Um, so I'm basically going to show the video at the beginning um, and then the rest is up to you guys. Make sure you do the typical, you know, mute yourselves if you're not talking um, and then direct people to the Q&A. And I assume, Jen, you know how to do the breakout rooms. So um, that's kind of all, all going to be up to you guys. I'll moderate the chat just a little bit, um, but it's mostly you guys and I'll be here for technical support if you need it. Basically. You're, we're already live, but I'm going to allow the participants in as they join. That aren't you guys, obviously. Um, Any other questions for me? Top of the hour, we'll run the video, and I'll I'll be no, both okay. muted and. <laughs> Let's do a quick audio off, check. Make sure everyone can hear everyone video. else. Um, Ashley, do you mind unmuting yourself? Here I am. All right, you sound good, Giovanna. Hey guys. Okay, great. Um, Karina? Hello. All right. And Jen, I've already heard from you. Is this everyone who's going to be presenting there on the channel today? Uh, have you heard from Alicia? Alicia. Hi. Good morning. Oh, there's an Alicia. Oh, she doesn't have her video on. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and stop the video. And about um, five till, I'm going to open it up. Or actually, no, you're already recording, so we're good to go. Um, I'm just gonna pop off and show the video screen, and then I'll start it right at the top of the hour. Will this, um, Samantha, will this part of the recording be part of the YouTube streaming, or once you start, once you hit stream in the sessions? Part? Once I hit stream, it will. Okay. So as soon as, so quite literally, as soon as I put the video presentation. Um, so probably a minute till I'll stream it live so that there's a little bit of a buffer and then we'll start right at the top of the hour. All righty. Uh, let me know if you guys can help. Guys, I think I'm going to throw up. I'm so nervous. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why? I don't know. Just how you get, right? I was in there just doing some stuff and I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, I ate, why does my stomach feel like this? So yeah, about, um, being aware of the, giving this presentation for less than 12 hours. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm with you, Alicia. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> this is fun. 
my guess, you know, it's like uh, generally like people, there's people who are streaming on YouTube. So you won't even know how many people are there, um, which is what I've been doing. It's just very convenient to have that on my TV and still have my computer screen. And then we'll get some people in the, the Zoom, which is great. They're all people that are cheering for you and want you to do well and just want your knowledge and experience. Jen with the awesome pep talk. <laughs> also, so I wanna, I wanna chime in. Um, there have been multiple people who have had similar sentiments and like everything goes fine. You, trust me, like I made the mistake yesterday of starting a YouTube too early and there's an eight second clip of me and like two other people's faces on the video stream. And trust me, I felt horrible. So I don't think you can mess up worse than that. <laughs> That's not a bad mess up, Sam. It's awesome. It's, these are the worlds we live in. I don't really like doing like, I mean, I really like doing talking, but I don't like it at the same time because I'm very like shy. But one thing that helps me is just visualize like everything going right. Um, and and not like what I'm saying, but visualizing like how I'm gonna feel at the end of this. And I know that things will happen that way. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, uh, but I feel that that helps me like relax a little bit and go like, okay, like doesn't matter what I say or how I say it, things are gonna go right. I love that. And that really works because um, I literally almost missed my flight yesterday. And all I did was visualize me and my husband walking the airplane with no lines. And there was literally no lines because we we're the last ones to walk in the, in the airplane. If we were two seconds late, we would not be able to get in the plane. So uh, I feel the visualizing how you want things to happen. It will happen sometimes not the way we plan it, but the outcome will be what we visualize it. I love that. I personally just feel really um, held by being on a panel with all of you who like will, will be able to play off of each other. And then also to have Jen's moderation, like that's my buoy that we've, that we've got you kind of holding the container. I fully trust all of you. Um, I'm having to trust myself to wing it a little bit, <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be fine. And then also like envisioning who these folks are. Um, they're people just like us, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Or we've all been there, right? We all, when we started and all that, we've been there. So it's good. We're all good. Okay, Jen, can I have a request? You know, on the suggested questions for panel. Yeah. I don't want to answer should all solopreneurs aim to grow into a bigger, more complex business. Okay. I have no value to add there at this moment because I don't know what to say. Okay. I like that. Not, Not like off the top of my head, but as the conversation starts, maybe I'll have something to add, but I would like totally be caught off guard. Yes. And as a reminder with all of these questions, because I am going to be popping around and maybe even adding some new ones. If you have something to say, um, unmute yourself. And that's the indication for me to call on you. And if you don't have anything to say, stay on mute and I won't call on you. <laughs> all right. Welcome. So excited to see some people joining us here in the Zoom chat, and I know we've got some people who will be joining via YouTube. Thank you all for joining today. This is awesome. Um, this is going to be interactive. There will be questions. So if you have questions, uh, drop them in the chat. We are here to answer your question and give you value as a solopreneur, solo entrepreneur. We are so grateful that you are joining this session and excited to have you see have you uh, here today? This is awesome. Right. 
as you're joining us in the chat, feel free, as you're joining us in the Zoom room, feel free to drop in the chat. Um, who are you? Where are you joining us from? What type of business do you have or are you looking to build? Um, we would love to learn more about you. Welcome, welcome. Hope you guys are having an awesome Denver Startup Week so far as we are on day two. We're gonna be getting started here shortly. If you are joining us in the Zoom day room, two. drop in the chat, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and let us know a little bit about your business. And if you are on YouTube, there's still time to join the Zoom room, come on over. If you wanna just join us from YouTube, that works too. We will have breakouts where you can ask questions of our lovely panelists directly. So Zoom is where it's at. Um, welcome, welcome. Right. It's great to be seeing so many of you as we come in and talking about um, building a growth ready business as a solo entrepreneur. I'm so grateful that you are joining this session and there will be a lot of opportunities for Q&A and we look ready. We're ready to have you. Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Ben Data, co-chair of DSW. This year marks the 10-year anniversary of Denver Startup Week. This community has been the catalyst for lots of change over the past decade. And this week, we're coming together to celebrate the past and dream big for the future. We are able to bring Denver Startup Week to this community thanks to our 2021 sponsors. Thank you to our HQ and title sponsor, Amazon, and our title sponsors, whose leadership makes this week come to life. Capital One Cafe, Downtown Denver Partnership, Fluid Truck, Hotel Engine, and WeWork and our track sponsors who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible. Founder Track, Kickstart, Growth Track, Friday Health Plans, Developer Track, Quizlet, Product Track, Palantir, Designer Track, Battery 621 in the Public Works, People Track, Exactly, and Spotlight Event Sponsor, Strat Labs. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement this week. Thank you to B-Side Fund, Colorado Public Radio, Comcast, Coors Brewing Company, Denver Pavilions, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver, Gusto, J.P. Morgan Chase, Method, Moss Adams, Pine Insurance, Promontory Mortgage Path, Red Bull Basement, Southwest, Tattered Cover, and VF Venture Foundry. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors listed on the screen. Please say thank you to these companies as you enjoy our hybrid Denver Startup Week. And don't forget to use hashtag Den Startup Week to share your experience and moments of inspiration on social media. Have a great week. Welcome to this session of Denver Startup Week. I'm Serene Pappenfuss, a principal at Kickstart Fund. We're on a mission to build great companies in the Wild West by backing the boldest entrepreneurs with capital, community, and expertise for the journey. A lot of VCs happen to invest in Colorado. At Kickstart, we focus on it. We love our Colorado startups, Sondermind, Nomad, Pomp, and Havenly, just to name a few. Because we were among the first seed funds in the region, we know what it's like to start something before others understand your vision, which means we're willing to lead investments in promising teams. We use our experiences to grow your startup and recruit top talent. Our portfolio is filled with visionary founders like you who are committed to moving the whole ecosystem together. It's the network effect in full effect. Raising venture capital is more than swapping shares for money. It's inviting the right investors to complement your team. We hope will be your choice for seed funding in the Mountain West, and we hope you enjoy the session. Thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary of Denver Startup Week. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow, regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, 
sexual orientation, or the combination of those identities. There's something for everyone at DSW, thanks to all of our community members who submitted their best content to make this week what it is. And thank you for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors for their support in helping us to keep DSW free and accessible for all, especially our Founder Track sponsor, Kickstart. With that, please enjoy this session and the entire week ahead. All right, welcome everyone. Big shout out to all of the sponsors and the Denver Startup Week Planning Committee for making this event possible um, and making it virtual and able for us to connect, whether we are all here in Denver or across the country. Welcome to this session on building a growth ready business as a solo entrepreneur. Solo entrepreneur, solopreneur, business owner, Whatever title you resonate with, I'm glad that you're here. We have a panel of some incredible people and professionals who have a specific niche and area of opportunity to help you determine if your business is a growth-ready business and how, how you can grow it. So I am gonna introduce our lovely panelists. We are gonna jump right into it. If you are here in the Zoom room with us, welcome, drop in the chat who you are, what kind of business that you have, make some connections. That is one thing that Denver Startup Week is all about. Um, if you do have any questions, you can send them directly to me or you can put them in the chat. We are gonna try to get through as many questions as possible. Towards the end of the session, you will also have an opportunity to join a breakout with each of our um, panelists. And I'll get into that a little bit later, but first you should probably know who our panelists are. First up, we have Gigi. And Gigi is the CEO of My Cats and Me, where she serves small businesses as a profit first strategist. If you haven't read the book, download it, add it to your bookshop, read it, it's an awesome book. And she is also a money coach. Gigi has experience in bookkeeping and tax prep. Uh, Gigi helps creative entrepreneurs tra translate their numbers into stories so they can understand, so they can make smarter, more intentional business decisions. I totally have a girl crush on Gigi. Love what she's doing. And you guys will all have a girl crush on her too by the end of the session. Next up, we have Alicia. Alicia is a BA or virtual assistant that specializes in empowering business owners to focus on their passion while she executes their vision. She started her business in 2019 after the birth of her fourth child. Returning to her corporate role just did not align with the way postpartum life looked this time around. Alicia is that extra set of hands, that extra brain that you need to get things done in your business so that you can be operating in your zone of genius more often, doing the things that you envisioned you would do when you started a business instead of all the admin tasks that surround business ownership. Next up, we have Karina. Karina is an experienced strategist and designer. Motivated to supporting small business owners, she takes pride in creating easy to implement strategies. As a marketing strategist and graphic designer, her goals include simplifying and targeting plans for brands, websites, and social media that align with their objectives. Ooh, Karina is someone you need on your team when you feel like you're shooting all over yourself. Do you feel like you're shooting all over yourself and your business? I should be on Pinterest and TikTok and Insta and whatever the next social media is. Uh, I love that Karina has this streamlined process to help you thrive as a solopreneur. And lastly, we have uh, Ashley. Ashley is a small business attorney and legal educator who specializes in drafting contracts and starting businesses for creatives and wellness-based small business owners. She came to a small business law after starting her own business as a yoga and mindfulness instructor. Ashley and her partner, Ashley with Creatives Learn Law are fantastic because there is an opportunity where, you know, we have limited resources as solopreneurs and um, their services 
are attainable and there are different ways that they can help you get some great foundational elements in terms of contracting and those business foundations and considerations for you as you grow. Finally, my name is Jen Yuen. I am the founder of The Pledgeettes, which is a personal finance community for women taking an active role in their finances. We offer weekly money conversations as accountability groups, as people to celebrate, um, share experiences and ask questions. Later today, I'm gonna do a quick plug. 100 Women Talking Money is at five o'clock tonight. If you are around and interested, you are invited. It's gonna be a great session. So now I would love to jump into our lovely panelists. I'm gonna start with a question for all of them here. Um, how did you decide that you wanted to create a business as a solo entrepreneur? So for our panelists, I'm gonna start with Gigi. Um, first of all, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jen, for the amazing introduction for all of us. You're like amazing. Um, I think that my story is very similar to a lot of entrepreneurs out there. It came from corporate burnout. I was uh, working this job, a nine to five job. Um, I, I started this job, was my first job in America. I'm originally from Brazil and I grew very fast in the company, but I was overworked and underpaid. Uh, and I literally have a physical um, breakdown due to the amount of work I had. And I figured out that life is not to be lived working all the time. It's supposed to, our work is supposed to feed our purpose in life and really feed our lifestyle so we can live the life of our dreams and have a work where we can impact others. So my, I feel that my story is relatable to so many people that come, came from the corporate um, universe. So that, that is why I decided to start my business. Love it. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, Ashley, what about you? Oh, we are on mute. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I can really relate to you, Gigi. Um, you all may or may not be familiar with the legal profession, but it is renowned for being a very stressful environment. And I, as a um, as someone who values well-being and likes to be outside and to play with my dog, was like, how am I going to build a life for myself where I get to really spend time doing what I love? Um, and I also really wanted to serve people who shared my values. And there are lots of ways to do that in the law. There's lots of justice initiatives to be involved in. And my business partner, Ali and I um, are both are both pursuing as many avenues towards a more equitable world as we can. But as creatives ourselves, we we saw this um, opening where a lot of there are a lot of people who are in the same boat that we are wanting to curate lives for themselves and have no legal resources with which to do it. Um, and so we saw that need and we also had this internal need to feel fulfilled in our work and just brought those two things together. I love that Venn diagram of sort of what you're really good at, what you love, and and what the world needs and that center point is um, a really great place to move and when we moved in that direction creative learn law was born i love that ashley if you guys have not looked at the ikiga iki i'll put it in the chat google ikiga iki G A I. that can really help you clarify who you are in your business karina what about you what brought you to starting your business so my business started when my, the company I was working for decided um, I could keep my job, but I wasn't going to be doing design and marketing anymore. And I really wasn't into that. And so I struck out on my own. Little did I know it was also the beginning of the recession. But I um, was designing wedding invitations and I enjoyed that. But my background in corporate kind of kept festering and building those longer term relationships. So I wanted to pull it all together and have some of those longer um, term, like building something, building something with someone, supporting people and um, creating their business dream and being part of that. Because I love that start off up kind of part of the business when people are just getting started and needing some help pulling things together. And so that's, 
that's my short story. I love it. And Alicia. Hey, everyone. Thank you again for being here. Um, I think my story is similar to a lot of us here in this Zoom room or on YouTube of just wanting to provide a service that is of value while being able to be a mom and with my family and not feel guilty about it. So just the idea of having to clock in or clock out or work this standard schedule just wasn't fitting. Um, another thing that really made me kind of want to jump out on my own is I think in our corporate settings, sometimes you know, we start in this role, but there's other things that we can do for the organization or that just um, align more with our values, but we're not really able to do that because we're stuck in this role and in this box. And as a virtual assistant, I'm able to um, use the creative side of my brain as well as just the very like, I need structure, I need this, that, or the other. So that is what brought me here today. I love it. Alicia, we're gonna stay with you. What is a VA? So a virtual assistant essentially is just, I like to say that we're like a Swiss army knife for your business, right? I think um, in my introduction saying, you know, some of us are creative, but then we can also follow systems and processes um, and be very targeted with our work. And so um, as a virtual assistant, you know, we just take the framework that the small business owner has laid out and really help them execute and implement um, these initiatives. That could be recurring tasks such as, you know, posting on social media. It could be invoicing. It's just all of those things that need to be done on a recurring basis that you don't necessarily have to touch or maybe don't have an automation um, in place. Love that. So very task heavy things that you find in your business that's not easy to add, um, automate. It's a great opportunity to start talking to a VA and seeing if they fit on your business team. Gigi, okay. Can I DIY my booking, my bookkeeping? And when do I know I'm ready to outsource it? Um, what I'm going to say might be a little controversial, especially in the accounting community, but I believe that everybody can and should be doing their own bookkeeping, especially when they're starting their business. Uh, bookkeeping is pretty much keeping track of your income and your expenses, and it helps for so many ways, right? One is tax season. You have everything organized, so your taxes will be a little bit less stressful and a little bit more pleasant if you have everything in place. And the other aspect is to really see the profitability of your business and be able to track in, in a consistent way what's working and what's not working. Because I believe that if you're not measuring, you cannot improve. So especially if you're starting your business, find that system that works for you. It can be an old school ledger, it can be a spreadsheet, it can be an accounting system, whatever it is, you absolutely can. Um, don't just don't overcomplicate it, keep it simple. And if you have need help and guidance from professionals, you can always schedule a session with uh, a tax accountant or somebody that you really trust and love. And I believe that you're ready to outsource when you spend too much time looking at your numbers instead of doing a money generating activity. So I, what I have in, in, for myself and my clients is if you spend more than 30 minutes a week looking at your numbers, you need to outsource because they're spending way too much time uh, when if you have somebody to help you, your time is very valuable. Um, definitely you should uh, looking into outsource it. And there's so many beautiful um, virtual bookkeepers that can definitely help you with that. I love that, Gigi. It's um, those revenue generating activities. If you are spending too much time in your numbers and avoiding revenue generating activities, that's me right there. I have a business health check meeting every Friday. I love going through my numbers. Um, and it is a way for me to avoid some revenue generating activities in my business. But you really do need to prioritize what is most important to you and your goals in your business. Gigi, I love that answer. All right, Karina, why do I need a marketing strategy? And can't I just start 
putting my business out into the world on a website and social and just doing things? So one, one of my big statements is always, if you build it, they will come is not a thing in small business, right? You have to be constantly talking to your potential clients, talking to your current clients and really um, keeping people engaged. Really, if you look at any kind of marketing, that's what it's about. It's keeping people engaged and making sure that you are in front of them, right? And if you just put your piece out there and you don't have a strategy, then how do people know how to hire you? How do people know what the next steps they need to take? But also marketing is about giving people the opportunity to get to know you, see if they like you, especially if you're a service-based business, if you're a single person, single solopreneur, putting yourself out there, then you're the face of your business. You're the person taking care of all of the um, different pieces um, that are more client facing, right? You might have help from someone like Alicia doing VA work, whether it's publishing um, your social media that you're hopefully writing or that get, you're getting a feel for your client base. Um, but you can't just put it out there and hope that people are going to find you. Um, you can have great SEO, you can have all of those things, but if you aren't continually communicating with your client um, or your prospects, then it's unlikely that they're going to um, be engaging back with you, which then turns into sales. Yes, I love that. All right, since we are talking about the start and the foundation of the business, Ashley, I want to ask you, what are the most important steps solopreneurs should take to protect themselves from business liability? You know, none of us started our businesses to, um, to be lawyers, except for you. Um, so, you know, as solopreneurs, what do we need to be thinking about? This is my favorite question to answer um, because they, they're really, it, the law can feel super overwhelming and cloudy. And especially when you get into the thought process around like what risks is my business facing? And that's when I really think it's time to start thinking about the legal foundation of your business. It can feel overwhelming and yet it boils down to just a few really simple steps that I find myself talking with entrepreneurs about over and over again. Those steps are first, creating a limited liability entity. In Colorado, it costs $50 to make an LLC in like five minutes on the Secretary of State's website. It's super easy. At a high level, what a limited liability entity does is it separates you as a person from your business. So if there are risks that come at your business, they don't attach to your personal properties. Um, and it's, it's relatively easy to create that separation. You need a separate bank account um, and you put all of your business money in your separate business bank account. You sign contracts as a representative of your business. Um, and it just does wonders in case you do end up in a, in a really scary situation and in, in a dispute to make sure that your personal assets, your house, your car, your wages aren't going to be on the line and that you just keep your business risks owned by your business. That's step number one. Step number two is to buy commercial insurance. Before you even think about hiring a lawyer or buying a contract template or working with a, a lawyer to draft your contracts, buy commercial liability insurance so that if there is a lawsuit or a dispute, if you run into um, damage of your property, you have a safety net, right? So that you can keep your business running and that's not just gonna pull you under right away. Um, step three, though, is to get really good written agreements in place. And so that's the, the main thing that we do at Creatives Learn Law is create contract templates and draft contracts for creative entrepreneurs. Um, contracts are about relationships and they're about clarifying your relationships. So anyone that you are in relationship with as a business, you want a written document that clarifies what the expectations of that relationship are, what each of you is going to contribute, who owns the risks, who owns the copyright. Um, and so on. So the, the types of contracts that we find ourselves recommending all the time are a client contract with the people or a customer contract with the people that you're working with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you are in partnership with a, with a, a, a friend, if you've got a biz bestie that you opened your business with, you want a partnership operating agreement. Um, if you've got subcontractors that you're, are working for you, an independent contractor agreement can be really helpful. And then, you know, it's the 21st century for all of us operating online, having terms of use and a privacy policy on your website. 
that would be my like high level checklist. Um, so we've got limited liability entity, insurance, contracts. The, the last few things that I'll mention are understand how to pay taxes. You can work with your bookkeeper to help you be prepared to pay taxes at the end of the year. But um, most entrepreneurs who are operating as LLCs or who are just single member LLCs or solopreneurs are going to be responsible for filing estimated quarterly income taxes um, once a quarter with the IRS. And so understanding your obligations there, understanding how to get a sales tax license if you're selling products, including digital products. Um, and otherwise knowing what your, what your obligations are, there's income tax, there's also self-employment tax, which is a huge shocker to people who come from W-2 employment. Um, and then sales tax and, and other, other responsibilities and privileges. I love how Gigi frames taxes as, as a, it's a privilege to contribute to the collective. So understanding, understanding that relationship. Um, and then the last piece I'd say is just knowing with your unique business model, the thing that you offer whether it's consulting or a product or design um, or mindfulness instruction, what are the unique risks that come up with offering that service? What are your clients or customers likely to run into and how can you um, alleviate that risk or minimize that risk? And that might include things like just being really clear in your communications or in your contracts about what the risk is. It might also um, include the way that you actually work with people on a day-to-day -day basis, just taking care to minimize injury, the risk of injury, um, whether it's a physical injury or, or otherwise. That's, those are the kind of the high level things. Um, know that it's, know that it's masterable for sure. Maybe a little overwhelming, but definitely something that I see creatives every day getting a handle on. Yes. And since this is a solopreneur topic, I love seeing everybody dropping their LinkedIn profiles and their connections into the chat, connect with each other, learning from um, each other as solopreneurs is so incredibly valuable. It's actually how this panel came to be because Ashley, Karini, Karina, Gigi, and Alicia all have different niche businesses as solopreneurs and they have come together to connect and share referrals and to solve each other's challenges and to help each other grow. It's so beautiful to be connected. Um, okay, we're going to stay on Ashley because we've got this question. We've, we're getting legal questions in the chat. So here we go. Um, talking about W-2 employees versus 1099 employees. Um, of course, I'm going to sh share Ashley's disclaimer first. This is not legal advice. So this is definitely like legal education. If you are look, if you have particular things on your business, it is a great opportunity to reach out to somebody who offers those legal services for you. Gigi is not going to offer you financial advice. Karina is not going to offer you specific marketing advice on your business, nor will Alicia offer specific outsourcing advice. So again, legal, marketing, financial, and outsourcing is what we're talking about. But let's talk generically about W-2s versus 1099s paying attention to federal laws, state laws. You're seeing all these chats. Ashley, what do you want to share? Yeah, I'm on it. So as somebody who is working with other people, whether you are their um, employer or you are hiring them as subcontractors and they're running their own business, it's your responsibility to properly classify your people, which means that if the IRS gets um, upset about the way that somebody is being classified saying that they're, they're operating as an employee when they really should be an independent contractor or vice versa. It's the person who hired them who's responsible for making that distinction clear. And the reason why it matters is it's about taxes. W-2 employers withhold a big portion of taxes on be to pay for things like Medicare and social security on behalf of their employees. Whereas as you all know, when you're operating your own business, you pay all of those taxes. Um, and so if you have independent contractors who are working for you, you're not withholding taxes for them. Um, you, they're also responsible for paying all of those taxes on their own behalves. Now, the trade-off, the reason why W-2 employers withhold taxes on your behalf is because then they can tell you what to do. When you run, an, an, when you're an independent contractor, you are independent. You, it's like, you really cannot be micromanaged by your clients, um, even though some of them might, might take 
take not have to have difficulty accepting that pill um, because you're running your own business. So you're not somebody's employee. You get to set your schedule. You get to set your style. You get to you get to decide how you offer the services that you offer. Um, and that goes for whether if you're working with subcontractors too, if you want them to be independent contractors, then it's really important to let them maintain their autonomy and how they run their business. Um, so if you're hiring a VA who has an amazing VA agency like Creative Planner, then you want to make sure that that, that, that person is, is operating their own business, a good signposts for the fact that they're really an independent contractor and you don't need to be withholding taxes is they have their cl other clients of their own. You're not their only source of income, um, that they have systems in place for running their business, that they set their own schedule, that they decide the details of how they provide you services. Um, so really distinguishing those two things and making sure that your ICs have lots of independence is, I would say, step number one. If you, if you do have independent contractors, have a subcontractor agreement in place, an independent contractor agreement. And if you have employees, then understand the federal labor laws um, and state labor laws that are in place as far as how you treat those employees. I love that. Awesome. Okay. We are going, we've got some great conversations around business banking here going on in the chat. Um, I love everybody who is sharing. This is what this is all about as a solopreneur. Get different opinions, start sharing. But Gigi, at the start of your business, how do you keep your finances organized? When do you open a business account? When do you get a business credit card? When do you do these milestones in your business, Gigi? Um, now. I feel that once you decide to open your business and you're starting like to market yourself, do a, if you're in Colorado, do the LLC. It's super easy. It literally takes five minutes. It took me five minutes to do that. As Ashley said, it's $50. And then I think the renewal is like $10, right? Um, yes, do that right away. You can go to the IRS website and apply for an IEN. That is pretty much the social security for your business. And with that, and that's free. So if you Google it and people are saying, oh, pay me $100 and I can do that. That's, uh, they don't need to do that. You can literally do it yourself. It's super simple. You get the IEN number right away if you're approved. And with that, you're able to open a business bank account, business credit cards, and so forth. Um, so, uh, if you're starting your business, I would, one of the first things to do is that to make sure that you have the, uh, separation because in accounting, we have what we call, like, we presume that your business, it's, a, it's own entity. So it's not a personal entity. So the best way to do that is separating the finances. Um, there are so many, um, uh, banking alternatives for small businesses right now. There's a lot of online banks like um, North One, Novo, Rely Financials, that those are 100% uh, online, super easy to bank, open bank accounts with. If you have a personal bank that you really like, you can always reach out to them to open your um, business bank account. That's the route that I did when I started my business. I would talk with my banker, I say, hey, I'm starting my business. This is a deal. How can I open a business bank account? How can I apply for a business credit card? Um, the best way to keep it separated is what is business is business. What is personal is personal. All the income should come into your business account. Um, and then you can pay yourself from that. And that's very important as entrepreneurs uh, to pay ourselves. And a lot of people forget to do that, but we are our most valuable employee. So we should be paying ourselves greatly. Um, and as a bookkeeper, that's how I started my business. I use QuickBooks Online to track everything and categorize and all the good stuff. Um, I know a lot of people that just do a spreadsheet uh, so they can see like their income statement every month and so forth. Depending on the stage of your business, you're gonna have different needs. And depending on what your business is, you're gonna have different needs. If you're a manufacturer and you're starting your business, you're not gonna wanna do a spreadsheet. So you're probably gonna do it QuickBooks desktop that has like a build assembly tools or accounting switch that is a online uh, accounting system, right? So um, the best way is to keep personal and finances separated and just track everything coming in, everything going out and don't mix everything because that is, um, 
it can be very messy. I love that. Gigi, anything else to add on why it's important to track your business finances? I mean, you just had so many great tips and Stephanie's giving you a shout out on this. <laughs> um, anything else on that or do, do you feel like you covered it? Um, I mean, I, I feel like for me, um, I work with like, um, I work with numbers, but my brain doesn't work in a linear way. My, my brain is very squiggly. So for me, tracking my numbers, it's not a dumpty task because numbers are linear is actually very exciting and it's very creative, my point of view, because uh, I started my business four years ago. When I look at my income statement, my balance sheet, all, all that good stuff from four years ago to today, I can see the growth of my business and I can see what worked and what did not work uh, through my numbers. It's, it's like, it's a very realistic metric for our business, right? So I feel that tracking your numbers, it gave us that uh, intelligence and knowing what's working and what's not working aside from our feeling and our intuition. And our, oh, I feel that this is such a good offer, but nobody's buying. Or I feel this is such a good price, but you're actually losing money every time you're working with your clients. So that gives you that metric that I feel it's very important to have. And you can only have with your numbers, right? Um, and I think it, it's a fun thing to do because you can really, um, th there's all the stuff that you need to do for taxes, for this, for that. But I feel that the most fun part of tracking your numbers is really being able to track measure and improve on the places that need improvement. Um, so that is, that's why I love numbers. I love it. And Wake yeah, up. you've got a, a bunch of uh, team squiggly brains going on as well over here. So that is great. Um, okay. So Karini, we're starting to get some marketing questions. I want to jump over to you. This, when, is it best to try to be a solution for all or niche? Like how specific can a niche be and what does having a niche provide you? I think that it depends what your business is, but starting off and understanding, like seeing where your biggest opportunities are by offering a few different things and then as you start to grow, you can look at, like Gigi said, look at the numbers, but also what you're most passionate about and what you want to be doing. You could have a great offer that you actually don't enjoy implementing or um, having to refine or having to support on a regular basis. So you want to find that right balance, but then niche down to what's that sweet spot for what you want to be doing, but also what your clients and customers are wanting from you. So that way you're going to be more engaged in your marketing and more um, willing to um, just basically avoid any kind of burnout if you're more engaged that way. So just keeping aware of all that and then starting to niche down um, I still offer a variety of services because I enjoy doing them all. And I enjoy like building that whole big thing, but there are other designers who are just doing logo design. There are people who will just do website design and, and I like helping people with all of that kind of like lifting them up kind of deal with all of those and, and we're making sure the pieces fit and work together. So that's, that's just part of my personal preference. So I think that people just need to find and figure out what's the right thing, but sometimes having too much means you have, it's difficult to message clearly to a lot of people and you're confusing them and they don't know exactly what you do or what you're an expert at. So that's another reason to niche down so that you can communicate with the people that you want to be working with, what your expertise is, how you're going to support them and how you're the best person to support them. It's much easier to make that argument to a very specific group of people, um, whether it's 
web design for um for specifically for wedding industry professionals right i've seen that where people are just focusing on supporting that so they're experts at it they know the lingo they understand the language they're putting together um, all kinds of materials and website um, graphics that they know work so finding that niche for yourself um, can really help build your business you just have to make sure that you're in that niche that you enjoy doing because you don't want to you don't want to lose yourself you don't want to be like okay now what i'm in i'm down this kind of down this lane and maybe i want to do a little bit more of this um so just make sure you're loving it i love that and i i believe that we have so many service providers in this session based on the links that have been dropped in the chat and as you niche as a solopreneur, you get to build referral partners. So if you are just building websites for wedding industry professionals, then you can also find people who specialize in, um, you know, social media or social or branding or graphic design or kind of Karina, like this umbrella is a great place to start. Um, I love what you shared there. Alicia, I wanna come over to you because I think so often, as a solopreneur, we want to just like hand over a pile of everything and to just have an extra set of hands to do everything that we were doing. So you mentioned earlier in the introduction that VAs really help with specific tasks. There are also online business managers out there. What's the difference between an online business manager and a virtual assistant? Yes, that is a great question. and a thorn in my side, if I'm being completely honest. So um, the difference between these two, so a virtual assistant really is the resource that you need to execute your plan, right? And so an example of this is you know your target audience already, right? Because you've worked with Karina or another marketing strategist and you know exactly who you're talking to, you know, maybe the schedule and and so your virtual assistant really is just going to schedule those posts and do that it's very clear on what they're doing whereas an online business manager is somebody that's kind of going to help you set up your back office and when i say back office i mean things like creating a process um, developing the resources needed to then outsource to somebody so i say this all to say as a solopreneur it is hard to draw the line, right? Like, I know that I need all of these things, but understand that there's not a one size fits all approach to that. And so when you're trying to determine what help do I really need or where am I gonna see the highest return on this investment, whether that is a VA or an online business manager is um, deciding if you need one resource or do you need three right because although a va is kind of like a swiss army knife we all also have a niche right so um, there could be some that are tech vas that are really helping you with your website there's some that are um, just like customer service right responding to all these emails maybe answering your phone if you have that so really taking a step back to decide what it is that you need and and be okay with that might mean that you need three different people to solve three different very specific problems. I love that and Alicia this brings me to a question for all of you, because you all are an outlet and an outsource of something in your business. I think so often we either say like I need marketing help or I need financial help or I need legal help or I just need help um, when solopreneurs are interviewing you to add you to their team, what are the great questions they should be asking to make sure it's a right fit? So if anyone ha wants to start, um, what is a great, what are the questions solopreneurs should be asking when they hire somebody to help with legal, finances, marketing, or outsourcing? Gigi, I'm coming to you. So I think that the first question you need to ask yourself is really what is that you're looking to solve? Uh, if somebody comes to me and they say, hey, I need somebody to do my books. 
okay, what you're trying to solve. You want an organized set of books. You want tax strategy. You want money management. What is that you're really looking for? And, and for me is making sure, like me, I work in the finance um, part of the universe. So I would focus on somebody that is familiar with your industry. Because when we're talking tax strategy, money management, all the good stuff, if you're a service provider or if you're a product provider, uh, it's going to be different needs and different strategies that we're going to approach, right? So I would make sure that you to ask that, first of all, have the clarity of what you're trying to solve and communicate with the person you're talking to, that that is what you're looking to solve specifically. And um, understand the understanding if they know your niche, they know your industry. And the most important thing is that if you vibe with them, if like the energy that they bring to the table and how they communicate is the way that you like to be communicated to. Uh, because I am very laid back. So my clients love that I'm very informal when I'm talking with them. But if I'm, if somebody wants an accountant that is more accountanty, that's not me. So we're not going to be a good fit. And it doesn't mean that I'm not good enough or if that, that they're not good enough for me. It just means that they need somebody that communicates in a different way. So I think that the, those nuances are the most important thing and the internal clarity of what is the problem you're looking to solve instead of the tasks that you need them to do? Because the problem is what is going to get you the most uh, return of investment when hiring that person. I love that answer so much because I think, you know, we just kind of want to dump work on other people so that we can focus on the work that we love to do and why we started our business. But it's more about that problem because there are so many offerings, whether it's tax preparation or tax strategy, those are two different things. Organizing your books versus a pricing strategy, two different things. So that is so great. Um, Ashley, Karina, or Alicia, anything else to add? I think you did such a great job, Gigi, of kind of like those basics um, around it. Karina, what about you? So I think that just setting expectations on both sides, right? As someone who helps people with marketing, some people want me to be doing like, hey, writing all of the stuff, copy for the website. That's not necessarily my area of expertise. I can work on that with people. Um, but I've worked for fishing guides and I've worked for wedding photographers and I can't know all of those things. I don't fish, but if I am given a little bit of information, then I can usually work my way through. But you want to find someone that's a good partner for your business um, that can support it in, in a high quality way, right? That's not to say that I I helped my client and he was super excited and he, but I need your engagement as a client as well. If you are not to, going to engage, whether I, I would guess this is across the board for all of us, if you're as a client, as a, as a client of mine, if you're not going to engage and give me the information that I need to do the best job for you, then it's really hard. I can't just be out there floating alone and coming up with all of your ideas and implementing your ideas. I need your input to make sure that we're meeting your objectives, um, short term objectives, as well as longer term objectives and building those relationships with your clientele as a marketer. Okay. These are all just everyone else taking as many notes as me because these are just all such awesome nuggets. And I love like if you don't want to work with this person, if you don't want to like answer the phone or if you see that you have a meeting with them and you're not excited about it, there are other professionals out there that you can get excited about. So don't feel like you have to hire the first person that you meet with every time. Um, 
Karina, also, Brendan's going to take you fly fishing every day because you're missing out on not having fly fishing as a niche. Maybe he'll get you to make it a niche. Um, Alicia, what about you? What are some great questions to ask when building out your team? So I think the one that is near and dear to my heart is really understanding work schedules, right? I think that as we're outsourcing people, um, especially if we're doing 1099s, as Ashley had alluded to, you know, you don't really control them, right? Like you control the work that they're doing, but you don't control when this is, you know, to be completed. So I really think that in that discovery session or the interview call, it's really important to understand when will you be completing my tasks or what are your normal work hours and, and really being clear on what that expectation is and um, being flexible in that, right? Or if you can't, then you can't. And that might not be the, the best resource, but really understanding when this person is working and you know the expectation on the output and the turnaround. Ashley, you kind of alluded to these contracts that you might have, a scope of work or a contract with independent contractors. What do you want to share about what you should do when interviewing these people? Yeah. When, do you mean when interviewing potential contractors to work for you, or do you mean when yes. interviewing lawyers? Cool. Yeah. Especially, and if there's anything in the niche of legal, that's a good Yeah. Answer. Yeah, um, when interviewing people who are going to come and work for you, I think I think personality can't be understated. So trying to understand like who these people are, what their values are, and whether they align with your mission, and especially as you're niching down with the audience that you're trying to reach. If you're um, if you're working with a marketer or somebody who's helping on your social media content or a copywriter, you really want to know that that person can capture your voice and can and can reach people in the same way that you can reach them. If you're working with a bookkeeper, you want to know whether you want like a suit and tie bookkeeper or like a cool Gigi bookkeeper um, and, and get somebody on your team who's going to kind of match not only the way that you work, but also if you're building a team, the way that the culture, like thinking about creating a company culture and bringing people in who are, who are going to, um, to amplify each other's skill sets and get along really well. Um, on the legal side, I would just say knowing that like, like every other service provider that lawyers each should each have expertise, um, and different areas of expertise. And so like your uncle who does wills might not be the person to write your service agreement. Um, and being willing to, to ask around and to find an attorney who really specializes in your specific industry. I think that's going to be helpful. And then, um, you know, it goes without saying, but how much do you cost is a really, a really important question to ask anybody who you're going to hire, whether it's an independent contractor or, or a licensed professional to be on your team, making sure that it fits in your budget and fits in your, in your overall vision. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that. Okay. So now if we are going to grow, we have all these resources where we can hire agencies or 1099 or employees. Um, but does every solopreneur business have to grow? Does everybody have to be bigger, more complex? Let's just start with that. Gigi. No. <laughs> uh, I feel that especially in the online base, like I work with a lot of coaches and, and people like um, in the artistry aside. For coaches, you see like a lot of people, they want to be a copywriter and stuff like that. A lot of people, they just want to be like agency model, right? So they want to hire a lot of people and have them doing the client work and they manage and all the good stuff. That is not for everyone. Uh, me, for instance, I don't want to have an agency because I really value the relationships that I built with my people. Uh, my clients are not just my clients. They're like my friends. They're people that I wholeheartedly believe in their mission. And I'm here to support them in the way that I can. That's through number talk, right? From bookkeeping to tax strategy to um money management that I use a profit first uh, methodology for that. Um, so I think that do you want to grow because you want to grow and that's the business model you're seeking for? Or do you want to grow because people tell you you should do that? Because that's how you make more money because that's not necessarily the truth. So I feel that um, 
we don't want like I feel it's hard for us to succeed by ourselves I do have a small team of people that help me uh, especially on the things that I'm not good at so they they're very they're better than me in so many things and that's why we, we made a very good team so the growth is do you want to grow because that's what you really want or you want to grow because you feel that that's a benchmark of success for people that are looking into what you're doing so um i don't think everybody wants to grow in that way and there's different ways that it can grow your business that is not just in terms of size Mm -hmm. Karina, what about you? I think it's a challenge as a service provider myself to, I enjoy working by myself and Gigi put it really well of nurturing and supporting these people and having their, that quality relationship with people. That's not something I can really hand off to someone else. So I want to um, maintain that. So for myself, um, that's, that's one side of my business. The other piece is that as a service-based business, you end up in a, in a position where there's limitations on where, how much I can grow as doing one-on-one -on -one services. I only have a certain amount of time. So I think that's always something to consider as a solopreneur. I can bring in other support people, VAs to help add um add in and do a little bit of management of some behind the scenes pieces um but again it's about that one-on-one -on -one relationship but i do work with other clients who are getting ready to grow they're you know wedding industry professionals is again an example of people that i've worked with in the past that physically they don't want to be out at weddings every weekend anymore they have kids they have other life that they want to live and so they're growing their business and bringing on junior people to help support their efforts and their long-term goals so i think that's a um something to always think about is do you want to be um doing the business as a service provider or are you thinking long term about becoming the business owner and being the idea person and then having other people who are executing? So I think that's an important distinction to start thinking about, even as a solopreneur in the first, you know, one to three years. But what does that look like in five years? What do you want it to look like um, in your business? I love it. And I love all of this conversation that's going on in the chat. Again, as solopreneurs, connect with others, share your LinkedIn profile, share your business stuff in the chat. We should all be connecting each other and supporting in great ways. This is a question that Kelly had sent me. What is the most successful way you have found new clients? So as solopreneurs yourself, what has been the most successful way you have gotten new clients? And of course, all of our attendees, if you have insights for Kelly, drop them in the chat of the best ways that you have found new clients. Karina. Because I want those deeper connections and building those long-term, more long-term relationships, my best networking has been a little bit on the slower side of in-person networking and building relationships that way, finding a smaller group of people. And one of the ways that I did that a couple of years ago was I partnered with another graphic designer and we just had a group of people that we enjoyed spending time with. And we um, decided to do a little kind of small business planning for this was 20 for 2019 no for 2020 so it was late 2019 that we did this so it was a little bit different but we built that relationship build those relationships in a small group setting and um, several of those people then um, down the road not immediately but within three six months um, became clients and I think that's another key component to realize about your business is what your lead time is between meeting someone, building, starting that relationship, and when they actually start to um, give you money for your product or service and understanding and finding the right places to go 
to meet the right people um, and then taking care of those relationships. And like I said, understanding how long it takes for them to transition. I know another marketer who would go and do, basically she would do a presentation like this or she would even be a moderator. And she knew it took about six months um, for someone to get to know her on social media through email marketing, maybe to before they would um, reach out to be an actual client. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. I love that. One of uh, the business coaches that I've worked with before has said, identify hair revenue generating activities and tortoise revenue generating activities because the hair and the tortoise will both get to the finish line and you kind of need this mix in your business. Um, Ashley, what about you? What has been the best way you found clients? I think just being willing to offer value is like, is really, really important. And not so much that you're giving away your services for free. Everybody should get paid. Um, but like we offer a lot of free legal tips on our Instagram page and on our YouTube channel. And I think that's a really nice way that people find us is that they actually get something without even having to pay us. They, we start to get to be in their ear and teaching them about the law and building a relationship. They get to know our personality. And then when it comes time to actually purchase a customized contract template, maybe they feel like, oh yeah, those lawyers, Allie and Ashley, they seem like they might be a good fit. Um, I know that my business partner, Allie, also uses this all the time in Facebook groups by being in the in community online and being willing to answer questions without giving legal advice and drop in blogs to, to legal tips and um, in general, just make yourself available and helpful. Um, it goes a long way, I think, towards that longer term trust building relationship that you're looking for in a paying client down the line. And you also get the chance to get to know them and make sure that the people who you're bringing in are really the ones that you want to work with. Love that. Alicia. Um, I'm kind of going to piggyback on Karina in terms of just leveraging your network. Um, and as a solopreneur, right, what is your network even? If you're coming from corporate, you might not even have one yet. So it's really important to build that and to show up and engage, right? I think that um, I'm gonna kudos to, to Jen, our moderator, because you know, in the beginning of starting, um, Jen had like just invited me to things and I could show up. And then with that came relationships with other people that turned into referrals. And so I think, especially because full transparency, before I started my business, I hated social media. I still don't love it, but I didn't even have a strategy out there to attract my ideal client or even know when I was posting and what I was posting. So to really just make those in-person relationships, um, and, and just be engaged and involved. And, and in turn, you'll get referrals. You, you know, you're the person like, like Karina said that you talked to six months ago will finally send you an email or try to try to find you. So just really try to build a network, be in spaces with people that are like-minded, be in spaces with your ideal client, right? Not just um, peers per se, but you know, who do you want your client to be, be in those rooms, build those relationships. Gosh, I love all of this. This is so awesome. Um, okay. I wanted to give you guys all an opportunity. Um, attendees, this is your part. You're called participants. This is your opportunity to participate. We've got two choices here. One, do you want to stay all together in the same room or two, do we want to go into breakouts with each of our panelists? So in the chat, Put one if you want to stay together. Put two if you want to go into breakouts that are individual. Um, while you guys are answering, I'm going to, oh, all right, we're all going to stay together. It is an overwhelming responding one, 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 one. Love it. We're going to stay together. Um, okay. Ashley, I'm coming back to you. This is kind of a DIY versus hiring out. When should people hire a lawyer? And when can you do it by yourself? Can we just buy online templates? Can we just ask our uncle who writes wills to help? Uh, can we watch a YouTube video? When do we do it ourselves? <laughs> when do we hire a lawyer? What does that look yeah. like? 
Great question. So, um, and our, you know, I come from the perspective of offering both for the last two years, my business partner and I have been a law firm that have been serving clients in a custom one-on-one capacity. And recently we've really started to amp up and build out this template shop. So you'll hear me kind of speaking to the value of both, um, just as a, just as a heads up, I think, and the short answer is that you can, you can do most of the foundational pieces of your business by yourself. I mean, creating a limited liability entity, opening up your separate bank account, buying insurance, asking around for referrals for a bookkeeper and for insurance. Um, True, classic lawyer answer, it depends, always, (laughs) just can't get over it. Um, You can do some of those basic things, even finding a contract template document that you can use to start working with clients. Or if you don't have a contract template, understanding what clarity and communication you need to have in your emails even to make sure that you can start accepting pay and giving services and not running into huge legal risks. But as you start to grow and as you start to sort of create a business model, your own unique style, then I think it makes sense to invest in legal tools and maybe an attorney to help you navigate those legal tools. So the first step is if you're a service provider and you're in an industry that is well-established, like you're a wedding vendor and there, you know, there are lots of photographers or planners or caterers or consultants who are in your same industry. Um, And obviously you're going to have your unique flair on things, but there are other people giving the same services that you provide you might be able to find a solid template that is going to do just fine um, for you. And when you're shopping around, I would say just look for which industry, the people who, who, who wrote those templates, number one, do they have a legal background? That's really key. I see that all the time. And then number two is, do they have a, a knowledge of the unique concerns and um, and risks that might that might be facing your business industry. Now, if you're building a business that doesn't really have a cookie cutter model to follow, if or if you're uh, run, doing things totally differently than other people in your industry, it probably makes sense to work with a lawyer to custom draft your contracts. Um, and of course, typically people know when they are really, really needing an attorney um, to answer a question or handle a dispute for them. If you're, if you're facing a situation that you just feel totally overwhelmed by, um, then it's worth, it's worth talking to some lawyers and seeing if there's somebody who can meet your needs within your budget, recognizing that legal services are awfully expensive and it's a, it's a total racket. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to find an attorney who either will give you a flat fee for what you need, or will be able to quote you in advance and say, I'm going to spend one hour on this and this is my fee. And this is how much it's going to cost. So you don't um, end up spending more than you intend to. Awesome. Karina, ah, time is such a gift and it is something that solopreneurs do not have a lot of. Um, I don't have time to do every and all of the marketing stuff. How do I create a marketing plan and find the time to implement it without keeping me from actually doing the work I love to do in my business? So I have a couple of things here. So one, I say, I always recommend start small and build rather than building some big elaborate plan and strategy and then not having time or feeling overwhelmed by it. So scrap that and just start small, but use the tool where you are most comfortable, but where your clients are, right? So you don't have to have a Twitter account, a Facebook page, an Instagram place, and a blog, all of the things. Find where your people are hanging out and spend the time there over somewhere else. The other thing that um, I've been working on this analogy in my head, like it's just still like, what was it? Squiggly brain, Alicia, you, you all were saying earlier, but, but think of your marketing, like you bought ingredients at the grocery store and you have it all there. You can make so many different things that can be overwhelming. But then if you make something right, I'm a bit, I, like leftovers. So I will make a 
roast in broth for ramen. And then I will use it for tacos later in the week, the leftovers. And I will use it for um, a quesadilla or something else later in the week, right? And so marketing, you can use your marketing knowledge like that. You can have a piece of content um, say on a blog, or maybe you have a video content, well, then you can translate and use pieces or all of it again in email marketing, in um, on your Instagram or other social media accounts, different places to share bits and pieces of it, but not the whole the same way again. Right. So you're using that main piece of content and then you take the little bits that are left over that you can break down and use in a different way, different places. So I think that's another way to ease the burden of this big thing with marketing. And again, just choosing your spots of where your clients are hanging out and where you're most comfortable um, putting up content. Huh, I totally exhaled the first sentence you said of start small. You don't have to do it all. Thank you for that. Now I can. Now I will say, I do, I do want to say that I usually and almost always advise that clients get their username on across all platforms, right? And even if you just one time a month post something to Twitter or one time every whatever the Twitter lifespan is because they will shut I do believe they'll shut down your account now if it's an inactive account for a certain amount of time so that you own your business because somebody else can go and take your business name and people will find them over there and they're putting up content that either isn't related to your business or who knows what so I do advise that you own all of your names across platforms and then just do minor updates to them, publish um, content um, very infrequently, except for really where your people are living. I love that. Thank you. Okay, Gigi, we've been talking, there's been a number of um, Profit First fans that are in the chat, um, and this kind of came up with bank accounts, and in your introdu introduction as a Profit First strategist, but what the heck is Profit First? Oh, I love Profit First. Profit First is a money management system created by Mike, Mike Holowicz. Uh, he wrote a book and I recommend everybody starting their business to read the book because it's, he's from New Jersey. Uh, I still live in New Jersey and he's very New Jersey. Uh, so it's a very fun book to, to read, uh, even though it talks about money. And Profit First is pretty much the envelope method um, that a lot of grandmas used to use, my grandma included. That's where you get all your income and you have an envelope for rent, one envelope for utilities, another one for grocery and so forth. And, and we get that system so you know how much money you have available for each aspect of your business. And you get that um, money. And instead of doing um, with envelopes and cash, you do with bank accounts. It sounds daunting, but it's not. Literally to do profit first for my business. And I have about 10 business bank accounts. It takes me uh, 15 minutes. So it's not that difficult. Um, but the thing that I love about Profit First is that it, use, it, it works with human behavior. It doesn't work against human behavior. Uh, so when we open our bank account and we see $500,000, our brain goes, ooh, I have $500,000 to spend. We're not thinking, well, but you know, 20% of this is for taxes. 10% um, of this is for my employees. And I don't know how much percent of this is to pay myself. Uh, our brain doesn't separate like that when we're looking at the bank account. So what Profit First does is you have different um, bank accounts for each item. And every time you do your money date or whatever is that you call, 
uh, you look into your numbers and you see the income for the period and you'll do percentages to each bank account. Uh, this way you do have money to pay your taxes and you know exactly how much money you have available for you uh, for your business at the end of the period. And if you are um, product-based, it's very, I, I think it's a very uh, special money management system to use because you can do like have an account for cost of goods sold, have an account for sales tax and all those things. So it just makes a little bit easier for you to see exactly how much money you have available for your business. And um, I'm, I got very excited talking about Profit First because it really transformed my business once I start implementing. And that's why I seek like the certification and um, every business that I work with, I'm always like, let's do this guys, because it's, it's very, um, it really like, it's very transformational. But the thing that I like the most about Profit First, and that's how I saw the most change in my business is, is using that as a budgeting tool. So you're starting your business today and you say one year from now, I would love to hire Karina to do my marketing because I really like her vibe, but I don't have money right now. You open an account called Karina's account and every month you're going to transfer 1% of your sales to that account. So a year from now, you have budget to hire Karina and that can be for whatever it is that you're dreaming. And and then, uh, and profit first is called because you take the profit first. So the first, uh, what we call distribution, the first transfer that you do is to your profit account. This way your business is always profitable. And this is a very like easy foolproof way to see if your business is making money or not. Um, so uh, I hope that answered your questions. I get very excited. So my brain goes so, so many different places when I'm talking about profit first, because it's, it's, it's an amazing money management system. It's not a money system. It's not an accounting system. Profit first is different than tax accounting is different than tax strategy. The strategy that we have is saving money for tax, but it's not, uh, it's just a money management system. I love it. That's awesome. Um, Josh mentioned in the comment that I did mention that I had a business coach. Um, for each of you, do you guys have a business coach or a mentor? If so, how did you find that person and kind of how do they help you grow your business? Gigi. I am addicted in having coaches. I love being coached. Uh, so I have different coaches. So I have a PR coach. I have a human design coach. I have a business coach. I'm um, a business coach. Her name is Christina Scalera. She, um, she actually is living in, in Colorado right now. And she, her background is it's legal, like Ashley. And she's a great business coach. Um, I work with her for uh, since I started my business. Um, and I feel that it's again, like what is the transformation you want to get and business coach is not a consultant. So they're going to guide you through it. They, what I call it's like, they're going to hold a mirror in front of you and show your potential and all the avenues that you can take, but they're not going to do the work for you. So it's getting clarity. If you want somebody as mentorship and guidance, or if you want somebody more hands-on, those are two different things, but I think that is um, understanding the results, like what is that they do? What kind of business coach are you looking for? Are you looking for somebody that does more legal, more money management, more you know branding? Because there's so many different areas that you can go for. And, um, and again, the vibe. You need to work with somebody that how they communicate with you it feels inspiring. Instead, it feels like they're attacking or criticizing you. So it's all about communication and make sure that you vibe with them in that way. So it's like a very positive relationship. But I have like five coaches right now. So I'm a junkie. I love it. All right. So as we, um, as we kind of wrap this up, I want to make sure that we are going to pepper in probably a few more questions in this, but um, where can people find you 
And uh, do you have any closing comments? So Karina, I'm gonna start with you. Where can people find you? And uh, closing comments. People can find me on um, at lbcdesignco.com. That's, it's short for Little Bird Creative. So lbcdesignco.com. And uh, I'm mostly on Instagram. Same thing, LBC Design Co. on Instagram. And closing thoughts. Ooh, these are always like, feels like I should, you know, like present some special nugget, but I don't know that I have any. I've, I think I've already shared them all. I just, I, I just strongly believe in starting small and um, getting in the groove and building consistency in what you can manage first in marketing and then build on that as, especially when it comes to social media. I think that's where most people get overwhelmed. And then um, having just a great landing web page for your website um, to start with. Um, if you're just starting out, just having a place for people to find you. And even if you're just selling one thing that you can have a buy now or um, hire me um, button right there. And that's all you need. Awesome. Uh, Gigi. Um, so you can find me. Um, so my business name is quite unusual. It's called My Cats and Me Financial Coaching. Um, and the reason is because we can all be more cats. We can have clear boundaries, ask for what we want, and say no to things that we don't want to do. Um, you can find me on Instagram, hello underscore my cats and me, or my website, mycatsandme.com. I love uh, connecting with people and just uh, helping them be more confident when we're talking about money and numbers. Um, I think that the tip that I have is going along with Karina, start small. Things don't need to be overwhelming and understand that money can be very, very fun. And even if you don't like what you see today, you can only improve if you know where you are right now. So make sure that every business decision you make when it comes with money are decisions that are aligned with your end goal and your mission instead of just doing because everybody else is doing. Everybody else is doing Facebook ads. You don't necessarily need to do that if that's not aligned with uh, your views and how you want to run the business. So I think that... Uh, money when we are aligned with how we're using your money and we understand that is actually a very fun thing to look at um it really changes our relationship and we become a little bit more abundant i love that alicia um if i could say anything about takeaways it's the same as um karina and Gigi. it's start small and really understand um, what it is that you need. And we all know that our businesses are precious little babies and it is hard to get some stuff off of our plate, right? Because there's not somebody that's going to write this blog, how I would write it. They're not going to pick the picture that I like this, that, or the other. And, and I get it. And, you know, but we have to, you know, drop a few breadcrumbs here and there if we want to move forward, but start small, start, start with a specific task and give that person some time to, to do it in a way that you would do it, right? I think another um, takeaway from this is you have to get comfortable with somebody, right? So as you onboard whoever it is that you're outsourcing to, we have to take a little bit of our corporate with us in terms of there's a 90 day onboarding plan for a reason, right? Because you have to be coached, you have to be trained to get to, you know, ideal results. And so I guess that is my two cents. Um, oh, I was supposed to say where you can find me. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can find me at creativeplanher.com um, and Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, the same thing, um, Creative Plan Her. So that's all I have. Thank you guys. Ashley. Yeah, I'm going to take a different tact and say, take a break. That's my, that's my big tip is like, take some time back, um, take a day off in the week, have a 
an end day. Um, one of my favorite little things that I got when I first started in the world of entrepreneurship was to have a workday shutdown ritual. And my partner and I will still close our computer at the end of the day and say across the house, workday shutdown ritual complete. And then it's like work is over and you get to be a human and you get to have your life. Um, I think that when you're like doing something you care about, it can feel all consuming. Um, it can be so stressful and like anything you can do to take care will ensure that you can do this for the long haul. Um, on the legal side, I'll just say that like you're not going to land in, up in jail. Um, you're, like, the risks for small business owners, for really small businesses, for solopreneurs are small. Um, so try to exhale more than you hyperventilate. Inhale and know that you can handle it. Um, and if you can't, then there's help available. You can find um, my business partner, Allie, and I at Creatives Learn Law on all the platforms. I also, um, Instagram is probably our favorite and YouTube, but you'll see us on Facebook and Pinterest and LinkedIn too. Um, I'm also going to drop a link to this uh, free workshop that we created called Business Law Basics. If you're wanting to dive in a little bit more and understand how to build a legal foundation, um, you can you can check that out um, and really would love to connect with you all. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you all. This was so awesome. Again, my name is Jen Ewan. I'm the founder of The Pledgeettes, which is a personal financial community for women taking an active role in their finances. Um, I have a million windows open for all the people who dropped their LinkedIn chat, uh, their LinkedIn profiles in the chat. I want to connect with you. You all should connect with each other. Uh, my big takeaway is as a solopreneur, just because it's a solopreneur title does not mean you need to be a solo in it. It's not a solo journey. Find those communities that support you. Find the coaches, find the mentors, find the resources that can help you outsource, automate, love your business um, and join a join a dance party with Ashley at Creatives Learn Law because that is also such a fantastic way to take a break in your career. Thank you all so much for joining. We're gonna stay on for a few more minutes and answer a few more questions. Um, thank you to Denver Startup Week for putting on an incredible week-long event to kind of help us not be so solo in this world and in our professional career. There are incredible events the rest of the week. Stay connected, stay involved. This is such an incredible amount of, uh, an incredible space for you to thrive in your business. Um, I'm gonna just keep going through with some questions, but if you do need to chat, if you do need to drop to go have lunch before your next DSW thing, um, please go ahead and do that. Uh, Samantha, anything else we need to do here? Samantha is our DSW contact. Um, all right, there is a lot of thank yous going on in the chat, which we so love and appreciate. Somebody had a question on as they build out new offerings in their businesses and new ideas, should they create a new business or can they do the same business legally, financially? marketing wise, uh, outsourcing wise. Who wants to jump in on that? As your business grows with new offerings um, and new revenue streams, should it stay one business or should, or when should you make maybe multiple businesses? Ashley. I can hop in really quick from the LLC side. We get this question a lot. If you, um, knowing that an LLC is about separating your property, the, the property owned by your business, it makes sense to create multiple business entities. If your different business models are going to own really different property. Like if you're, if you have a spa over here that has all this equipment and then a consulting company, and you really don't want the risks that are, um, that might come up with your consulting company to like get at the tanning beds or whatever the equipment is, or if there are really disparate risks, if one is a really risky business and the other one is like not so much, then it might make sense to do the paperwork to separate them. But if you are, um, you know, a coach and you're also a photographer and you, have, you see like very different, um, you see the same clients rather, if there's not a lot of, if there's a lot of overlap between your people, then it's probably safe to have a single entity. I love that. Uh, financially, Gigi, when would you separate it or keep it together? Um, 
I would go with what Ashley said because um, I feel that I'm just organizing my thoughts a little bit. Um, I feel that when we are talking about finances and tracking income and all that good stuff, we wanted to have it like break down in a way that you get it and you can see where your your sales, where your revenue is coming from. So if like, let's say, I'm going to use me as an example because for me, it's the easiest way to do. I'm a bookkeeper, but I'm also a profit first coach, right? So I didn't see the need of opening secondary business, secondary bank accounts and everything else because I work with the same clients. My bookkeeping clients hire me as their profit coach. Most of the people that hire me as their profit coach, they do um, end up doing their bookkeeping with me. So it's kind of one and the same. Uh, so I didn't see the need, but let's say um, I'm a bookkeeper, but I'm also a uh, digital portrait artist. Then I would have two different businesses because the, the source of income is very different. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. Um, so it's almost like, I think the financial advice goes a lot along with legal advice because we have a lot of ta uh, legislations and regulations when it comes to finances, when we're thinking about taxation. Uh, so if it's completely different, open a different business, but if it's not, um, you know, you can just uh, keep it together. Yeah, Karina, what about from a marketing perspective? So my answer is going to be pretty similar to the um, the other two ladies that um, if it's related and it fits and it makes sense and you have the same clientele, then it's okay to keep it there if you're not going to confuse your clients, if you're going to keep it on the same website and if you're going to market um, on social media or other places. However, if it's it's a completely different clientele or you want to be targeting it. If it's say like a, so maybe it's the same, maybe it's wedding jewelry. I'm going to go back to that wedding line. If it's wedding jewelry versus wedding um, websites, right. But that's still a different, even though it's both wedding and there um, you might be dealing with a lot more um, women as your clients you want to make sure that you're opening up like that, that other side of it, right? Even though there might be a lot of overlap of people, well, the people who are looking for your wedding websites, they're not there to buy earrings. They're not there to, you know, buy jewelry or do any of that. So you want to be in a separate avenue for those people, right? Um, that's, that would be my, my advice. I love it. Thank you all. We are at time. Have a wonderful day. Have an awesome Denver Startup Week. Stay connected. Be good. Take a break. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thanks for participating, everybody.